feel like, Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, great. So I mentioned a bit to the captain's circle in the breakout room. We talked a little bit about my path to coming to adventure, but essentially over the years, I've held many different jobs and roles in life. And it really feels like adventure has been this perfect culmination of all of my experiences and skills coming together uh, to sort of be a bit of a missing piece for the organization and the boat. Um, so starting from the beginning, essentially I grew up in New York City and then proceeded to, we began to move around when I was 10, um, including overseas to Saudi Arabia when I was in high school. And so finding myself, uh, first of all, growing up near the water, getting a total love and respect for the ocean and having some time on boats and then uh, taking that and continuously moving around and having to adapt and refocus myself wherever I went, I think created this really good melding of, uh, you know, adapting to boat life, I guess, you know, it's not, it's not really for everyone. If you spent your entire life on land and suddenly find yourself getting into a, a tiny bunk for a transit might not might not be the easiest transition but many of you that are involved in adventure do know what that experience is like and it becomes this little cocoon for you um but moving on my first jobs i had a number of jobs that were in education so my first job i was actually a teaching assistant um i helped with a physics class i did uh gym class where I actually had to play water polo and I was always the goalie and the losing team had to swim laps so I got really good at swimming that summer um through college I was a TA for physics and I was also a TA for uh intro to engineering and then I was a TA for the machine shop so I went into engineering school because I really liked knowing how things worked and I really wanted to gain an understanding of all of that and then uh, proceeded to get my master's and look down through the focus of life and saw that I just didn't really want to sit at a desk for a bit and I needed to take a few months off. I had saved up some money. I had a lot of things I wanted to do. Um, my friend, uh, Eric Clem, I don't know if he came to the talk or not, but some of you may have met him on board this summer. He comes sailing when he can. Uh, he actually had worked aboard the American Eagle through his teenage and college years. And uh, he's the one that introduced me to schooners. So we'd be sitting around the table trying to do our engineering homework. And I'd be like cranking away on numbers. And he'd be telling a story about calling on the radio and using animal names instead of the actual frenetic alphabet or some great sailing story. And I would just find myself getting captivated. Everyone else would be like, oh no, another story about the boat. And I just say, tell me more, tell me more. And then on top of that, he also was totally brilliant. And I'd say, how do you know how to do all these things? And uh, he'd be like, well, when I rewired all the lights on the boat, I learned about this and that. And I thought, oh my goodness, here we are sitting at a desk, but I could go sailing on these boats and learn all of these really applicable things. Um, so of course, through school, um, with uh, the competitiveness of being in engineering school and everyone else getting internships, I felt the need to continue on that path. So I started um, my internships through college for engineering actually were primarily project management focused because um, I did a dual degree program with Colby and Dartmouth. And so I was a physics major at Colby and mechanical engineering at Dartmouth and having to manage not only switching back and forth between schools, but also doing this uh, double major program, the time management and fitting, fitting all of the pieces together really segued nicely into project management. And also with the project management, I was always allowed, I was always going on site visits. So for me, it was much better than the design side where I was sitting at a desk working at a computer screen um, because I was moving around. So I was really fortunate because my boss and in my internships saw that 
potential and immediately threw me into some true project management roles where I was actually the lead on projects, which was great experience for me. And it was great financially for the company manager that was an intern. Um, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> you know, at the time, I didn't quite make that connection until later he told me, he's like, yeah, well, this is what I fill you out. <laughs> like, why don't I see that? Anyways, that's the world. Um, but so I worked in engineering. I went back at, between college and grad school. I worked in the pharmaceutical industry for a year as an, a commissioning validation engineer. Again, did a lot of project management, time management stuff. And then went back for my master's and decided I wanted to actually try this boat thing because it had been on my hit list for six years. And I said, I'm about to start my career. I could be doing this for the next 50 years. When else am I going to have this opportunity to go work on a boat? And so at that point, I had met another friend who worked for Ocean Classroom Foundation. And uh, I had heard through someone else that they were hiring. So I gave a call and uh, <laughs> I have to be careful because Kathy's here. He's going to look back in my file and find all the things from that time. But uh, <laughs> I managed to, I called and I said, I want to be a deckhand. I hear you're looking for deckhands um, and I'm, I'm available. I'm finishing engineering school. And the person on the phone said, well, you don't, I don't, I don't think you understand what you're signing up for. And uh, I said, well, I have a friend that's worked for Ocean Classroom. And so she said, oh, okay, you know them. You kind of know what's up. But the thing is, we don't, you know, you don't really have any experience. So we're a little apprehensive, but do you know how to cook? I was like, of course I know how to cook. And they're like, could you cook on a wood stove or on a diesel stove? And I said, well, I cook on a wood stove. So sure, you know, I've been living in Maine. I've been hanging out at off-grid ski cabins, cooking on wood stoves. And I uh, managed to convince them that I knew how to cook for a large crowd on a wood stove, which may have been a stretch of the truth. Maybe a large crowd was like, five to six people and not the 30 that were on board. Um, so it was a little bit of a trial by fire. And again, like this is just sort of how boats go. You just got to adapt and you got to be resilient and do it. And so I agreed to be cooked for two weeks until the real cook showed up, which I think was a blessing for everybody. Um, and uh, proceeded to start with my deckhand role because I was told that if I spent my time not cooking, learning, learning the lines and learning the knots and, and proving that I really wanted to be there, that I could do it. Um, and so that was my first opportunity. So I sailed with Ocean Classroom for a little bit and then uh, moved into the Windjammer fleet up on Maine, bounced around the schooners up there. I had fallen in love with the Gloucester fishing schooners because my first boat was Spirit of Massachusetts. And uh then went to the Gloucester Schooner Festival, saw the American Eagle, wanted to sail on that boat. So hmm, found my way to her. And then, uh, you know, I've held a bunch of other jobs, but moved through the fishing schooner fleet to Roseway. And then Adventure was next on the list. So the only other one left right now is the Ernestina, but uh, we're pretty dedicated to Adventure. So I'm hoping to just get on a day sail on her. Anyway, so... I think that the culmination of coming to adventure, having backgrounds in education between engineering school and ski instructing and yoga instructing and doing education sailing, um, sail training, it just felt like such a nice opportunity to share so many of my passions on adventure, um, not only with our education programs, but also having crew that I could teach and uh, volunteers. So, you know, Adventures Robust Volunteer Program is just, it's such a blessing. And I saw it as an opportunity to kind of have this long sail training opportunity that also included so much more of the community and so much, you know, we could have the public out, we could have charters, we could have the kids and Similarly to what my experience was when I started with Ocean Classroom and I immediately was learning how to be a deckhand while also training students, you know, just trying to stay a step ahead in many ways, having the basics, but learning as I went, I, I said, you know, that 
that's really what I want from my crew. So I love the opportunity with adventure to train people as we go. And I think that's, that's what I want to offer. So I guess moving into my goals with adventure is uh, to continue to raise the excitement around the boat because she really is an amazing vessel. I mean, you think about the life that she's lived thus far, the fact that we're still sailing, the, the fact that she just, there's so few left out of 4,000 of these vessels built. And, and here we are with, with only a handful of them sailing and we're out there ripping around every day. I feel totally graced by it, um, totally blessed, but also uh, just kind of sharing that excitement with people and helping them have this hands-on experience of history. So in school, yeah, I was great at math and I could do the engineering homework, but history ironically was my least, you know, I, that was, the, that was probably the class that I came closest to failing, um, which is so ironic because what I love about these boats is the history. And I, and I totally nerd out about all of that. And so showing others about how the hands-on applicable history and really getting to feel it and feel the energy of sailing and, and, and kind of trans, transmute ourselves to this place that, oh man, these fishermen were out like, oh, it's so, th there's wind and there's waves. And then thinking, yes, but they were out in January chipping ice off the rigging in a rougher place working around the clock. And, and that's what I really want to be able to um, help people experience on adventure. So seeing the way that my uh, excitability, as I think most of you have experienced this, this, uh, some may call it, um, uh, attention deficit disorder but uh being able to find an environment that that uh really thrives and kind of helps helps the organization and helps the boat has been really wonderful so moving forward into the sailing season unless anyone has any quick questions about my about Anything that I've touched on there, anything you want me to elaborate about, but there also will be a time at the end. So moving on to adventure and how I ended up here. Um, so Phil Dunn, one of the volunteer extraordinaires, one of the really strong core members of Adventure's volunteer group here. He had come on Roseway as a volunteer with me for a transit from St. Croix all the way back to Gloucester. So he flew down and wanted to be dropped off back at home. And we had a great time. He wasn't on my watch, but uh, I saw how this volunteer, he, you know, he wanted to go, he, we were anchored waiting out some weather and we needed to do a rig check. And he said, oh, well, Cap, do you, how would you feel about me going aloft? And I said, oh, we're due for a rig check. I guess I was the mate at the time. So he said, mate, um, how would you feel about the rig tech? And I said, you know, that would actually be really beneficial because you have a totally separate set of eyes. And, um, you know, we see the same things every day. So yeah, that would be great because maybe you'll catch something that we might not notice because of this sort of customization. Um, and so apparently that really imprinted on him. And when Adventure was looking for a captain, he said, you know, I sailed with, I sailed with Krista. Maybe she'd be interested. And it just so happened that the timing had worked out. I was sort of shifting my own path because of sweet Bonnie, who uh, if you've sailed with us, you may or may not have met her or you may see her in some of the marketing videos because she loves to steal the camera site. Um, but uh, I wanted, I saw this opportunity to continue doing what I loved working on these vessels that I was so enamored with using my um, sailing skills and my wooden boat skills to, but still being able to have a little bit of balance with land life and having the ability to keep my dog and, and not be uprooted and away from home for so much. So I said, actually, this could be a really good fit. And at the time, again, transitioning a lot, I came down or I had a zoom meeting, um, and I met with some of the board and said, okay, so far, everything looks good. And then I met with the whole board and I was like, wow, they have some really smart people that are so dedicated to this organization. And I really felt like joining adventure between the board and the volunteers. Um, I felt like there was so much support to be had. So it seemed like 
even though I hadn't sailed on board, I was really um, felt really fortunate to become part of this team. So, you know, trial by fire. I didn't have any other captains that had sailed on the boat. I had a totally green crew. Um, Greg Bover was, I was like, so Greg, what about this type of sailing thing? And he was my, my best, uh, you know, my best reference because he had sailed on her for so long, but again, he had never held the captain role. So I had to, um, pretty much just step in and say, all right, here we go. I've never sailed on this boat. Most of my crew hasn't, but we got this and, uh, went out for our first training sail, forecasted eight knots, got out there gusting at least 25 knots, decided just to go under foreign jumbo and she ripped right out of the harbor. I mean, we were going eight and a half knots with just the foreign jumbo. And I said, oh my gosh, this boat has spirit. Cause I had seen her so much over the years, but she was sitting at the dock where it was light air and she was kind of motor sailing. And, and I thought, I had no idea that this, this boat had this spirit. Um, so we left we tacked around we were coming in I was feeling the effect of the current and um noticing that she didn't quite handle the way that Roseway or the American Eagle did with just the the jumbo and foresail but and I ended up having a motor sail it was terrible I was so disappointed but first day out sailing green crew it's okay we're playing it safe so came in went to the dock decided the next day we would try again the forecast was about the same and this time I said you know let's just tuck a reef. I'm not going to set a full mainsail if we're going to have the same thing as yesterday. We can always set the, we can always shake the reef. So we went out and we probably had a nice steady uh, 15 to 18 knot breeze, but we had the reef. So it was beautiful. And man, we sailed. And we, again, we were cruising this time. She felt so balanced, perfect with the, with the reef in. I said, all right, let's see how this girl tacks. So I had JJ at the helm and I was like, all right, JJ, just a little slower on the helm. Like, this is what I want you to do. And he came around and JJ and, and Greg look at each other. I'm like, what? Like, did I do something wrong? And JJ goes, I have never seen this boat tack like that since we've been here. And immediately like that just brought all the excitement. And I knew that um, it was just, it was that kind of that moment of like, this is a great fit. Um, Adventure and I have, kindred spirits we're both stubborn we're both a little fussy and uh but we really like to show people what we're capable of I guess so anyway so continuing on through the season you know what it, the, the time when you're when you're running through the season like that sail after sail after sail after sail it all blurs together but I think it was about halfway through the season uh during a rig check we found the rot in the gaff and um we had been sailing you know, for at least six weeks, probably at that point. And uh, we had to take the gaff, so we couldn't use the mainsail and took this as such a great opportunity to really learn the boat in a different way. So I thought, oh my goodness, how are we going to keep this boat sailing? Or we can't really go with the mainsail. I don't want to be motor sailing around all the time. That's just not the experience. Like, it's, it's a tool, but it's not the experience that I want to share with people. Um, so I thought on my toes and remembered that Roseway had a trisole. And as many of you know, Roseway's not sailing right now. So I wrote World Ocean School and said, hey, what are the chances that uh, Roseway's trisole might be available? And they said, yeah, it's in a storage unit in Boston. Come down anytime. So Phil, myself, and Kai, one of our deckhands, got in Phil's truck at five in the morning, got some, uh, had some coffees and seltzers with us, drove down to Boston, grabbed the trisole, rushed back up, tied it on, went out sailing and uh, really started to learn the way the boat handled without the mainsail. Because, um, you know, with the fishing schooners, so much of the power is coming from the mainsail that you spend a lot of your time de de determining what you're doing just based on that like that's the first sale you think about um because it requires so much more manpower and so much more forethought to adjust it um but so then having this uh storm trisail which actually again another opportunity we're like this is how they ran the boat when she was fishing so what a great way to kind of get another experience of um 
adventures history firsthand. So the crew had a great time because this was the sale that two or three of them could uh, haul up on their own. We could play with it. We would change. We would change where it was set on the mast. We would change the way it was tacked. We would change the tension, and then finally we settled into our favorite spot of it, and. Uh, it was just enough to help her point because with the knockabout, with the four and the jumbo, I just found that I couldn't get to the wind without having either the mainsail gull winged or with this trisail. So it was, again, another wonderful opportunity to bring a deeper understanding of how adventure handles because, you know, these boats were built to go fast out to the fishing grounds, heave to, come back in. And sailing around Gloucester Harbor is a totally different experience. And um, yeah, just uh, continuing to kind of learn, learn her ways. Um, but uh, I also came into this season with all these rumors about how adventure couldn't tack without the engine. And so again, something that adventure and I have in common is that we're both very stubborn. And so if t someone tells us we can't or someone tells us what we do, we're probably going to say, I can't like, don't you tell me I can't. I'm going to do this thing, you know. Sorry, Stuart. It's, he has to deal with a lot of this a lot of sometimes. But uh, anyway, so I came in determined to show I said she is a Gloucester fishing schooner. There is no way that this boat doesn't tack. And so first thing I did, of course, was call Captain Jim Sharp and say, hey, did this boat not tack when you had her? Which of course is an answer was no. I would spin the helm, I'd walk forward. By the time I got to the foredeck, the headsails would be back. I'd pass them over and I'd walk back to the helm. And by the time I got to the helm, she'd be on her new tack. And so I said, okay, I gotta figure out what has changed since then because I had heard all of these stories of the glory of adventure, kicking all of the butts of the other schooners during the schooner race and racing down the bay and just you know even though she was so large I think about this all the time because I've heard stories I heard stories from um Captain John Foss about when he worked as a crew on adventure but uh one anecdote that he told me that I'll share is when uh a crew member fell overboard because the y'all boat he got in the y'all boat and the y'all boat fell from the davits and I'm sure Captain Sharp would have a better recollection of the story, but I'm gonna abbreviate it here. So they're going through the Fox Island thoroughfare between North Haven and Vinyl Haven, which is fairly, it's a fairly narrow channel. You've got a fair amount of small boat traffic and you have the ferries moving through. And this thought in my mind, I remember we were going through the thoroughfare when Captain Foss told me this story and I was like, I can't imagine sailing a boat like adventure through the thoroughfare and then having to deal with a man overboard situation in here and turn the boat around and do all this stuff without the yell boat. And so, um, you know, I, I knew that there was, there was more to her that this, this rumor about the, uh, her only being able to tack with the engine was not right. So I, I affirmed with Captain Sharp and then proceeded to move into it myself. So I would try different things like changing the way we, we turned the helm and the amount of rudder we used and then changing how long we backed the headsails and which backs, which headsails we backed and what we did with the foresail and what we did with the mainsail and essentially figured out the sweet spot to get her to tack because the most embarrassing thing was May 19th. We had to go out for the, um, for a marketing photo shoot with the other schooners and we're all sailing around and they're taking pictures and there's drones and we're having a great time. We're just running up and down the promenade. It was dead downwind one way. So again, another trial by fire. I'm having to train green deckhands how to drive this giant Gloucester fishing schooner mainsail on the fly. Like here we are, we have to do this. We're jiving and so jive, upwind, jive, upwind over and over and over again. And then they said, okay, why don't you guys run out to the breakwater? So we, we proceed to fall off, have a nice sail out there and uh, go to take the tack and stall right in front of all the cameras. And I was determined. I said, never again. So moved into all of this, um, ended up figuring out that she tacked better with a reef and figuring out the effect of the rudder. Um, 
and then also with the ballasting. So as many of you have noticed, she sits higher out of the water than when she first came back. And that actually um, was a long journey of going back in the history of this long rebuild and figuring out that it's actually due to Coast Guard damage control or uh, damage stability reasons. So when everyone says, oh, adventure's sitting too, too high, we can, uh, you can help start the bureaucratic process, bureaucratic process of appealing to the Coast Guard for that one. Um, so great sailing season, figured it all out, back the mainsail, things are fussy, but we'd get through it and uh, move into yards. So part of this was uh, having to, yeah, there we go, we queue up. So we come into the railway, anticipated projects were a larger rudder to try and help with our tacking um, and also for preservation. So we had the, what we believe is the original rudder was still on the boat. So trying to stay ahead of any sort of um, damage or uh, I don't want to say catastrophe, but any sort of problems along the way, we're trying to stay ahead of that. Um, and we were going to get a new propeller because the existing propeller due to cavitation had become pitted and potentially of a uh, subpar alloy. But then uh, the worm shoe, having the just the worm shoe as a sacrificial piece of wood, and I added in the mass. So after the uh, the masts are due to come out every ten years, anyways, it had been seven seasons with COVID and the boat not sailing and not having a full time crew. Some of the maintenance had fallen behind the loft, and so it just felt like a lot to do from the air was to get it all stripped down. And then also with the uh, accident in Maine, it felt like now was a good time. We were already planning on being out in yard and uh, what better time to work on the mass when the, the, the railway had space, we had the time. If we had any issue, we had the whole winter to address it. So I added pulling the mass out. Um, and then once we were out and we had the masts out and I pulled the iron that holds the jib stay off, we unfortunately, there was some rot. Um, Pamela, I think you can just put the, the slideshow on and uh, yeah, we'll, I'm, I'm going off the cuff here. You can see that the plastic that was up on the bow was actually covering the initial find. So, with the mass, again, this was an amazing showing of volunteers. I felt totally, um, you know, I want to say heartwhelmed, but I was just totally overwhelmed by the positive response and the way that the crowds came out. So there were days that I'd look down and we probably had 15 volunteers out there stripping the mass heads. It's freezing cold. Everyone's bundled up. And uh, I mean, you can't even compare what they what they came out versus what they went back in. You can see that we took the cap off of the mast and painted it with red lead. We pulled all the bands, we stripped all the paint. Um, and and really, you know, it was it was Natalie was my only paid crew member that was available. So she was kind of down there on the ground running things while I was overseeing the big picture. And then we had Phil and Greg just totally run the show with so many people there. So again, thank you to all of you because we could not, we could not have done such good work. So now the masks are back in a point that we can put them back in. We can continue to maintain them from aloft and wait for another 10 years. Um, so some fun things we found about that. Uh, the foremast is in fact the original main mast of adventure. So Captain Sharp, when he ran the boat, he took the main mast and shaped it to replace the foremast and then put a new main mast in. Um, both of those are Douglas fir. Um, something that I really interesting was that the foremast is not actually, uh, whereas you look at the main mast and the heart is totally centered, the foremast is not a, a centered, a centered um, heart. So it's off center, which actually there are some uh, checks that are inherent and the Coast Guard has regulations for the checks. So one of our checks, the Coast Guard was like, oh, we're getting close to the depth. But because of this off-centered heart, I was able to show them, which something is something we couldn't have done if the masts weren't out. We were able to look at the base of the mast and actually see that the side that the checks were in, that it was so far from the heart center that we would be okay. 
Um, so the mass got cleared, but unfortunately in this process, we found that the stem had some pretty significant rot. So I had a little anecdote I called, I called Natalie and I said, have GMR take those irons off. And then I just want you to stand behind them and we'll paint it. And she's like, I don't think I can stand it. I'm like, Natalie, you can sand the paint, like just sand it and throw some primer. And she's like, I really think you should look at this. And I showed up and I said, Ooh, yeah, you can't touch it without the pieces falling out. So again, like, first of all, shows the incredible resiliency of wood. Um, but second of all, it just shows the importance of checking things and, and removing ironwork and looking at it. So you can see here, we pulled off the, um, the rotten part of the stem and behind it, the, the butts of the planks. Um, you can, I wish I had like a, a laser pointer or something, but the planks running down the side, you can see that they've rotten. Oh, thank you. You can see they've rotten from the inside. The timber behind that are what we call the night heads. So those are, um, solid framing that runs from the stem uh, just after the hawse pipe. And so once you find um, some rot, you have to keep investigating until you get to good wood. So the other aspect of this is that with the planking, instead of just scarfing, um, so making short repairs on the planks, even if those planks were good, we would have to stagger them so that the wood continues to lock together and, and act as one structural member. So we found this rot behind uh, in the planks and uh, you can advance through the slides here and see what else we come across and had to keep going. <laughs> so part of that, oh, go back one. So as I had mentioned, if we go back, uh, you can see how the, the lengths of the planks are staggered. So again, this is for structural reasons. The Coast Guard has a regulation that our planks have to be at least eight feet, but then also you want uh, the, the butt spacing to be a certain amount of frames away. So in here, you can see the night heads. Those are the structural members that have the hose pipe. Thankfully, the starboard side, only the forward one was rotten, but on the port side, um, all those night heads, we had found that uh, they had rotten from inside the planking too. This is very normal for fishing schooners um, because this area inevitably doesn't get enough airflow through it. So it's, it creates an environment for the bacteria that spreads rot to grow. Um, so in many aspects, this is not surprising. This is also the area of the ship that gets worked. So fresh water ingress comes in um, and works its way down. So once again, it's part of wooden boats. It's part of our responsibility to preserve the boat, to keep her sailing, just checking on these things and addressing them before they became a big issue. This probably wouldn't have shown itself for another 20 years in a actual functional standpoint, but now we can rest easy that it hasn't spread further. We can stop it and um, continue to maintain it. So this bow project, this is why the primary reason we've been out of the water for so long, she's moving along. We can advance through some of the slides. I have pictures of her closed in. Our new propeller, beautiful. I think Stuart just wanted the shiny picture. And here we go. So on the starboard side, um, we again only had to replace one night head. We made some slight changes to the shape of the stem that is actually more historically accurate. Um, so you might notice that she doesn't have that bit of the stem that sticks up. This is actually how she was historically. So I went back to that shape. Um, and we also made a slight shape in the front of the stem, which I have another photo coming up of. Uh, this is Nick replacing the night heads. You can see these fresh fresh, beautiful pieces of lumber. We were really fortunate um, with a lot of these projects you need to, in order to source oak nowadays, um, you really need to have a lot of foresight. It's not like we can do like they did in 1926 where they just had planks all the time. And some boats have been able to have that, but um, given adventures timeline and our storage requirements and our various focuses, we don't have any planks at the moment on hand, we had one, uh, which obviously we need more than one. So we we're really fortunate that uh, Tony Finicaro, our shipwright, was able to make the connections with some people that did have oak so that we could actually complete this project. Uh, so Nick here, we put in oak top timbers. The other thing is that Adventure during the rebuild was planked with pine. Um, 
And so we're switching to oak just for her longevity and the lack of uh, good solid yellow pine available. I mentioned the rudder. Um, how am I doing on time here? I don't have a clock handy. Um, but anyways. we're we're about uh, I think we're at about six oh five. Yeah. So okay, great. Maybe a few more minutes, Krista, and then okay, we can perfect. Have questions and answers. Yeah. Um. So real quick, I'll talk about the rudder. Uh, we did plan on uh, just modifying the shape of the rudder to be a more traditional. Gloucester fishing schooner shape. And uh, with that, we thought we would have the same solid wood rudder post, but in the process, we were not able to find a, as I mentioned, it's getting hard to source wood. We were not able to find a good solid piece of oak that was clean enough to justify and large enough that could be our rudder post. Secondly, when we actually hauled out, even though we were blocked higher on the cradle in order to create space for the rudder to come down, GMR was going to build a to GMR was going to dig a hole under the boat. We were going to drop the rudder down through the hole, just like they would have historically. But what we found was during the rebuild, the angle of the rudder trunk, because her stern had lowered over the years, um, it was not actually physically possible to remove the rudder. So there is there was a picture in the beginning maybe that showed the rudder post laying on top of the rudder. Historically, it would have been one solid rudder post with the rudder, but we had to cut the post, which then again led us to um, problem solving mode. So not only could we source the lumber for a post, but we also had issues with uh, how were we going to get this rudder back in now that if we can't take it out in one piece, we can't put it back in one piece. So we have shifted to a steel rudder post, which you saw in the last photo, um, which has been fabricated between Roses Marine and GMR. This is not obviously how she would have been done, but other vessels um, such as Roseway and the Bowdoin and the Thomas Lannan all have steel rudder posts. So this has been accepted by the Coast Guard. It's the materials that are available and it allows us to make a flanged rudder. So um, what we're doing is having the wooden rudder as you can see here. And if we move towards the end of the slideshow, you can see the the final that's her and her shaping our new shape again nick flanking keep moving uh, the boat covered in snow the new stem iron all right carry on next one there we go all right back oops so you can see here the steel post um comes across this is where uh the lighter part of the rudder is is where two plates will come down so the post will come down with two plates that the wooden rudder goes up between and then they will be through bolted there. Um, so this will allow the rudder post and the rudder to be put in and out in two pieces, which, uh, you know, we might not have touched the rudder again for another 75 years, but this allows us if we need to, uh, we can dis disconnect and maintain either or do any work to them independently. Um, I think that covers it for haul out and my whole blibber blabber about everything. If there are questions, now is the time to ask. <laughs> and and feel free to send those in the chat and we can ask Krista in turn or people can raise their hands and start um, engaging with Krista directly, but just wanna be careful we don't create a cacophony of, of voices. <laughs> No, that was fast. I think we have to do it. I think we'll have to do another one with with more specific one topics. <laughs> yes. Well, I have I have a question about um, the history, uh, Krista. When you were talking about your background and your education and so forth, um, do you think like the fact that our history is very experiential is is a reason why you are attracted to? to the history of adventure and, and promoting the history of adventure in the way that you do through your job versus, you know, studying textbooks per se? Most definitely. I mean, everyone has a different learning style or a blend of learning styles. But for me, um, as I've mentioned, like feeling the energy and, and being able to experience firsthand what the fishermen may have experienced, even if we're just this little little tidbit of it um 
we uh it just yeah it's so much of so much of adventure for me is is feeling the boat come alive and it's something that has is just anyone who has sailed on wooden boats knows that wooden boats feel different than steel boats or fiberglass boat they hold the spirit they hold the energy and there's so many times that you hear these stories like jay jay tells the story about the hurricane of the boat getting uh totally knocked over and coming right back up because she had a hold full of fish and and you can't really get a, a a grasp on what that may have been like if you're not out there sailing and you feel adventure heal over this much and it's like oh no the boat's healing over and we feel it it's so exciting and so imagining just how far over that was like that's that's the type of story that you can't really um get a full grasp on unless you're part of it um so i saw a question about stockpiling wood Yes, I have. There is a Sawyer up in Maine who uh, gave us most of the wood for this project, and I've reached out to him. He actually has some untouched oak plots that uh, he is going to start sawing by the spring for us because we have some uh, other preservation projects coming up that uh, are going to require this. And so we're trying to get as much, uh, you know, start to start to have this stockpile and we're fortunate enough that we have found a storage Greg Bover has found a storage location and we'll take care of that all right I oh, can I go back up I saw there we go yeah what no. has been my greatest delight so far oh man Amy I would have to say having you on as an educational volunteer <laughs> <laughs> so first of all that reminds me I forgot to touch on if any of this sparked your interest or anything about adventure sparks your interest, I love our volunteer core, education volunteers, docent volunteers, sailing volunteers, maintenance volunteers. I love teaching. I love sharing this. And I try and inspire that and everyone else who does the work and provide leadership opportunities for others in the organization. So volunteering, reach out to myself directly at Krista or Krista at Schooner Adventure or info at Schooner Dash Adventure. All right. So, uh, new rudder will make a difference oh. in the maneuverability. Oh, John Morris, what does he have to say? Uh, so, when you hauled out this fall, a lot of things happen, yeah. which requires you to interact with a Coast Guard. Can you mm -hmm. tell us something about that process as, as you experienced it over the winter? Yeah, so... I feel really fortunate that uh, our Coast Guard inspector, Chris Blank, I actually worked with him a lot on Roseway. So I came in having an experience or having um, a relationship with him already. But also, uh, you know, in so many ways over the years, people have said, are you ever going to use your engineering degree? And what I have found the biggest benefit is for situations where the Coast Guard, you know, maybe they see a a rot pocket that they want to dress, or they had the question about the checks in the mask, being able to write reports for them with pictures and data and use these scientific writing skills that I uh, learned in school and submitting it to them so that they understand that we're looking at it, that they understand the situation and then being able to come up with plans for continuing to monitor or repair, um, they, are really quite pleasant when you when they know that you're not trying to hide anything from them. Um, so for example, with the STEM, I found it, I started to investigate as, as soon as I saw that it was gonna be a major, a major uh, repair. I reached out to Chris, he came down. I said, this is what we see, this is our plan, this is how we're doing it. He said, excellent, send me some pictures along the way and call me when the repairs are done and I'll just come look at it. So, um, and then with the rudder too, I had to I had to come up with a, a whole report to them and and show them our all our research to why we don't have to worry about the stability or the handling of the vessel. The rudder will be bolted, so it'll be lagged temporarily while we fit it all, and then it will be through bolted so that um, we can remove it. New sales in the future. We are currently working on a grant for a new jib that is slightly larger. Uh, one of the things I found this summer was that she tacks like a dream with a reefed mainsail. Um, and I think part of that is the ballasting, but uh, also that 
a larger jib would help balance the larger mainsail. So we're working on a grant that uh, Peter Bent uh, advised us to that we are and working with uh, sailmaker Sherm Brewer, Sherman Brewer, who took over for Nat Wilson to design a larger jib that will have a longer luff and a little bit more overlap without totally backing the jumbo. Okay. If one shows up midweek at GMR, can we volunteer to work with the crew? So at GMR, we are not allowed to work on the cradle or on the staging, but we are still doing regular volunteer days at the moment. Our big focus is getting all of our blocks serviced and that is a hundred percent volunteer effort. Uh, and so any day, rain or shine, we have a little workshop set up in the fish. On nicer days, we go up on deck and on other days. Okay. Nolan Ray says his hand raised. Uh, Krista, you talked about your engineering degree being very helpful. How about, has your liberal arts degree helped you as a captain at all? Most definitely. Thank you, Nolan. I know. <laughs> in reality, I didn't want to go to an, I should have seen the writing on the wall because I didn't want to go to an engineering school because it was too nerdy. So that's why I did this dual degree. But uh, there's so much, you know, my engineering degree helps me with the project management of these yards and the repairs and understanding how the boat works. But how many of you have come sailing and uh, had the technical, you know, you come on and I'm like, and this is how the engine works and this thing and that thing. In reality, we're there on so many other factors. So understanding, you know, being connected with nature and um, the people skills and the history. And there's just, I mean, I, I really feel like sailing on these schooners is this beautiful mix of everything you 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 need people that understand the technicals but then you also need the people that can just be one with the boat and experience the breeze and then you need the artists <laughs> industry-wide impacts uh with the accident in maine um so the biggest part of the accident in maine is that it's going to take a long time for them to investigate so First of all, the Coast Guard does their investigations and then it'll probably go into a multi-year, uh, you know, them deciding how to move forward and keeping it safer. My best guess would be that they're going to shorten the 10-year window to a five-year window and will be grandfathered in. I wouldn't be surprised if they no longer allow solid, solid spar masts to be replaced. Like they might make us go for... Um, Yes, for inspections. They might make us go for laminated masks in the future. Yeah, Krista, Mary mm -hmm. Helen has a question and that is, is the added canvas pre-approved by the Coast Guard? Um, so it is within our original designated sail plan for the stability. Yeah. And I am so grateful because I have uh, Jim on our board who is a naval architect and he can do a lot of that legwork for me because as you know, I have so many you know, so many uh, hooks out <laughs> for, for many aspects of, of the boat and having my support team of board members and volunteers has been, I mean, what we've accomplished is not, is not a small feat, so. Yep, and Bridget has asked how you are adapting to Gloucester. I love it. I mean, it's, it's, I love the community around Gloucester. I love that um, besides going to the grocery store and looking like a zombie and having people come up to me, um <laughs> say oh you aren't you the captain of adventure i need i need milk um besides that aspect i love that uh just like stepping into this role where i was welcomed with open arms and it seems that everyone in gloucester has had some part of some some part of adventure whether it be through family that fished on her or they volunteered when they came back or they sailed on her as a wind jammer or maybe they just came out on a day sail or they knew someone that did and so having that, just stepping into a, a community that was so well circled around, around the organization was great. Oh, I love, so ed programs. I absolutely loved the Girls on Adventure. Um, <laughs> thank you. I love the Girls on Adventure uh, program and I am really hoping that we can continue to grow it and share the excitement. It was sort of a, I guess it was a streak of luck that we that you guys hired a female captain in the year that this program was starting because it provided an opportunity for me to just take 
take my end of the program on board and run with it. And, and I, you know, things I learned from Captain Smith, if you, you get them on board and you say, all right, you're on this line, you're on the helm, you're on this. And, and just immediately took them off the dock and said, let's do this. And, uh, seeing, seeing the way that these girls that maybe weren't friends in school and they came together and bonded with each other. And then when they've returned and seeing the way that they light up when they show people like, Oh, and this is the dock line. And this is number four. And this is what I do. And then we go to the halyards. Come on, I'll show you the halyards. And so empowering, um, empowering other females in that regard is just one of my favorites because you know there definitely is some upstream swimming at times whether we want to acknowledge it or not best advice to a young woman um you're no different than anyone else and don't let anyone tell you any else so if you want to do something do it and it doesn't matter if you're 125 pounds because you can be 125 pounds of sheer terror <laughs> all right i wait i feel like oh 23 any other questions that i've missed um so what how do you see the season shaping up? Oh, i'm getting a rebound on someone else's vocals what did you say pamela i said how do you see the 24 season shaping up how do i see it shaping up um it might have been in the captain circle i talked about this but I really, um, something that I would like to focus on since there has been so much change and, you know, trying to, trying to decide what route for the organization to go since the rebuild. And it felt like this year, we just really had taken off. We were sailing a ton. We were doing these programs that felt really great. We were taking the community members out and being able to continue to grow those roots and establish ourselves in the community in an even deeper way with more consistency um, feels really important to me. And then also um, taking the time to do little adventures like we did one night in Rockport with the crew that was totally magical and had a really great effect because suddenly on Facebook and in the Rockport groups and different people are posting pictures of like, look at adventure in Rockport. And that's such a, it's such a great opportunity for the crew to connect on board for us to do sail training with volunteers. Um, and then also we went out to see whales because I, you know, having all these green crew members, I wanted them to get little blips because even if they don't return to adventure, I want to continue to foster them in the industry. Um, because, you know, you can, you can do a summer on adventure and pretty much go any path within the maritime industry or, or elsewhere. And uh, yeah. So returning crew, I would say, well, we got Natalie. I'm not letting Natalie go because she's my right hand woman. And I love having two power. Not only is it a female captain, it's a female captain chief mate. Um, so I have them there, you know, as I mentioned, like a lot of this wanting crew to, to blossom and continue on in hopes that they then return. Um, some of them have actually already decided to try other boats, which is excellent. Um, one went on to be a flight attendant. One is in Spain. I'm hoping we get her back. Tessa, I'm hoping we get her back after her year in Spain. Um, and I don't know, Dalton has branched out to other boats too, but I'm hoping he might return. But yeah, so at the moment, no, um, Kai is currently working for American Cruise Lines. So he ventured into big boat world and is trying to get licensed. And that's a big thing that I support too, is getting them all licensed and uh, getting our volunteers licensed. Bill and Greg are hopefully getting their 200 ton upgrades so they can start driving more. Um, but yeah, at the moment, no returning crew except for Natalie, but we're trying to get some older returning crew back too. So if any of you know anyone who's interested, please, send them my way. Adventure is not back in the water. So at the moment, I, uh, you may or may not have picked up, I'm not in the frigid temperatures. I am in Hawaii on a surf trip. Um, and that's because it was always opened up. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the rudder is nearing completion. Um, they have put the plate, they are fitting the plates right now. And by the end of this week, she should be going for her dry fit. And then the planking is just about done. There's probably two days of planking left on the port bow. And then we are actually very tide constrained. So 
with adventures uh, draft she's a she's tide constrained but because we had to block her an extra 16 inches high to try and get the rudder out we have to get an extra 16 inches of tide so um february 6th is the earliest window that we can our next our next window that we can put her in so hopefully the somewhere between the sixth and the ninth we we splash her um if all goes to plan but again we will have been out for four months so there's there's plenty of uh potential for things to you know not go to plan so we're gonna wait to celebrate until we're back in the water and we're back over at maritime gloucester you have to get coast guard sign off before you start the season i do so every year we have our um annual coi inspection where we go out we do drills uh, Adventure actually has a two year cycle for her hull inspection, but I had the hull inspection done and that's all good. Um, the masts are taken care of. The only thing that we'll have to do is pre-season. We have to go out with the Coast Guard with new rudder. Um, so we'll go and do our normal stuff, but they also wanna just see that the rudder is handling and working sufficiently. When are you? Uprising. I think that was supposed to be upbringing. <laughs> so our first sale of the season, um, similarly to last year, I've allowed some early season charters to happen. So we're actually doing a charter on June 9th. So the uprig will be happening probably, um, I'll try and have the boat fully rigged within two weeks before that so we can get out and do training sales with volunteers and crew, uh, just so everyone's ready to roll and when we board 75 people there's no shock to that so uh yeah it'll be mid mid to late may all right looks like i think we're we're out of time here right mm -hmm. yep all right so i just want to say thank you all for joining and listening and please if you have more questions you can always reach out to me directly i love to share knowledge because you know, the more people that know about the boat, the more people that get involved in the industry, it's just, it's changed my life in so many ways for the better. And I uh, want to keep, the only way that we can keep adventure sailing is by having people come sailing and having people know what they're doing. Um, so please feel free to reach out to me directly. I would love to do another one of these if there are questions that you have or topics you really want to cover. And I think maybe Stuart wants to say goodbye. I just want to thank folks who in from all over. We got Kentucky. I don't know where else, how far away we have Captain Smith. But um, thank you. Thank you, Captain Miller Shelley, for taking the time out of your busy surf and hike schedule. And we look forward yeah, to Yeah, I got to go. I got to go hike up to a crater here after this. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everyone else, just stay in touch with us if you want to volunteer, if you want to be involved in other ways, and definitely come sail with us. Just be in touch with us, get on our mailing list, and we'll raise our glasses one more time if you got something still left in it. Autumn's up. Huzzah. Thank you, Krista. Thank you. Thank you, Krista. Thank you, Krista. Thank you, everybody, for being here and supporting Schooner Adventure. Sorry. Thanks, everybody. Yep.